The Man From Nowhere by Frank Belknap Long Beyond the fact that he had never been born, Ravel was no different from other men. He smiled cordially when friends spoke to him, sat in restaurants and ate, lived in an attic studio in Greenwich Village, and was conscious of a thrill when people praised his work. He painted for a living, and his pictures were unusual, to say the least. His friends thought him an imaginative genius. His sunsets were all wrong, being green instead of red. And when he painted the stars, you had to blink. Revel's stars resembled dazzling white porcupines lying coiled up in the sky. He also painted animals, which gave you the illusion of having just arisen from a chat with Sir John Mandeville. But everyone who knew Ravel said that he was alright. Ravel was a genius, and it was his privilege to take liberties with nature. Nature was a bum artist anyway. She had no imagination, and was always grumbling about cause and effect. In Ravel's paintings were scenes which put the cart before the horse, such as a storm breaking furiously in a clear sky, with rain coming down and lightning, people running backward across dry pavements to the shelter of wet buildings, or a submarine torpedoing a ship, the crew of the ship standing calmly on deck, watching the torpedo ascending straight up into the sky. Jim North met Ravel at a village studio party. It was past midnight, and North was sitting on the floor talking to an attractive, dark-haired girl about Ravel's sunsets. The girl was smiling at him, her large, gazelle-like eyes warmly radiant in the dim light. Although the girl wasn't an intellectual type, North liked her. She was a good listener. Her dark beauty was soothing, her vocal apparatus silent most of the time. She appeared to agree with everything North said. She was in all respects the exact opposite of Helen Kilday. Helen Kilday was always criticizing him, treating him like a child. Helen didn't even appreciate Ravel's sunsets. She thought Ravel a charlton, and derided North for defending him. North was pressing the dark girl's hand. Picasso was sneered at too, he said. You can't cross new frontiers without arousing envy and resentment. Ravel is a pioneer. He's setting up new guideposts in an unexplored wilderness. I am deeply flattered said a voice above them. North raised startled eyes and stared in consternation. Ravel was more than a little intoxicated. His hair was tousled, and his eyes were glowing with a spectral, Tarsier-like brilliance which gave North the willies. He seemed to be looking at something which North couldn't see at all. He seemed to be looking right through the walls of the room and out into space. You must forgive me for eavesdropping, Ravel said, but in my present mellow state, it is permissible to snoop. I am simply a detached observer, a super windchill. He crashed with appalling violence. His short, compact body quivered as it struck the floor, upsetting the snack table of his host and scattering sandwiches and cheese wafers in all directions. North gasped and leaped to his assistance, but Ravel wasn't accepting aid from anyone. He brushed aside North's preferred help and arose with surprising swiftness. He ascended on his knees and elbows and then straightened miraculously, seeming to have shed his befuddlement in a flash. I'll be all right, he said. I just didn't feel it creeping up on me. North nodded sympathetically. We never do, he said. 
Shall I get you some black coffee? Ravel smiled. Fresh air would be better. I feel like walking. Uh, yeah, yeah, so do I, said North. I intended to push off an hour ago. Yeah, if you'll wait till I locate my overcoat, I'll join you. Sure thing, said Ravel. I have a coat of my own around here somewhere. Five minutes later, they were walking together along Charles Street. The artist's stocky form bundled in a scotch mist topcoat. I'm afraid I made a spectacle of myself, apologized Ravel. I had seven martinis and a Tim Collins, but I'm dead sober now. North turned and stared at him in perplexity. I don't see how you sobered up so quickly, he said. It was easy, replied Ravel. I just undrank those cocktails. You, you what? Ravel sighed. I'm afraid you wouldn't understand, he said. I have peculiar gifts. North was silent for a moment. Suddenly, he said, I'm an artist too, you know. Perhaps I should say a uh, dabbler in the arts. Oh, said Ravel. Well, so am I, for that matter. A dabbler. I like to get the strangeness down on canvas, chiefly for my own satisfaction. I don't care a hang what people think. Your paintings are strange, said North. But here in the village, people seem to understand them. Your dealer is swamped with orders for them. Yes, conceded Ravel. In my humble way, I am a commercial success. But that isn't my main objective. So long as my paintings sell, I am grateful, for I have to eat. But that is not why I paint. Why do you paint? To work it off harmlessly. Painting to me is a sort of catharsis. To work what off? Asked North, his brow furrowing. Ravel sighed and stared down the long, dismal street. The block which they were traversing was distinctly atmospheric. On both sides of them were dimly lighted cafes and basement honky-tonks. Red and green electric signs flaunted such titles as Tony's Old Place, The Black Kitten, The Devil's Oven. The block was empty because the hour was an intermediate one. Atmosphere seekers from out of town seldom tarried along the bohemian length of Charles Street in the small hours, and the village natives had yet to emerge from their all-night guzzlings below pavement level. Ravel raised his arms slowly to escape from the temptation to do this. The street began unmistakably to tilt. It was horrible, frightening. The pavement beneath them seemed to sink downward, and the vista ahead to quiver and recede. The very signs changed. Around the red and green signs appeared dancing fortifications, like the aura of migraine, and the wind began to howl in their ears. From a cellar honky-tonk, a man and woman emerged, staggering backward. The man was slurring his syllables, his voice raised in drunken protest. I thought we wish having another, he complained. Wish the idea. It wasn't my idea, shrilled the woman. We just went into the place. The man ceased suddenly to stagger. As he moved with the woman across the street, his shoulders straightened and his voice shed its sibilance. Listen, Jane, he pleaded. I'm all right now. I can take care of myself. Stop pulling me backward. What happened to us? exclaimed the woman. We were pie-eyed and now we're... We're 
completely sober. The man nodded. Oh, we must be losing our grip, he complained. Ravel lowered his arm. Slowly the street swung up until it was level again, and the couple swirled back into the honky-tonk, their bodies jerking as they descended through a grillwork gate and down wooden stairs toward the raucous strains of a swing orchestra. Ravel wiped sweat from his forehead with the back of his hand. It's always a strain, he said, but I enjoy doing it. North was trembling, his jaw hung open, and his skin was as pallid as a fungus growth. God, he muttered, it's creeping up on me. I didn't have seven martinis, but I had enough. So, said Ravel, a faint mocking smile twisting his bearded lips. Think you can get home all right? I live just west of Greenwich Avenue, North said. I'm sure I can make it. Good. It seems we're neighbors. This is my place. Ravel had stopped walking and was nodding up at the red brick facade of a house which dated back to the late 18th century. It was a typical village survival, its antique chimney pots having looked down on generations of New Yorkers before the coming of the artist clans. Ravel extended his hand. Drop in tomorrow, or the next day, he said. I'm working on something now that should interest you. It's nearly finished, but it doesn't quite satisfy me. I may have to go back and unpaint it a little here and there. Thanks, muttered North. I'll, uh... I'll surely, I'll surely drop in, R Ravel. It was curious, but he didn't feel drunk. Ravel's, Ravel's long artistic fingers remained for an instant in his clasp, exerting a friendly pressure on his palm. Be seeing you. Be seeing you, he said. North did not notice the tingling immediately. It was not until he had crossed Seven Avenue and was within half a block of his lodgings on Ashland Place that he became aware that his hand didn't feel right. At first he thought it was simply the alcohol working off through his fingertips. He'd have to jam on the brakes, he told himself. Alcoholic neuritis was no joke. If he wasn't careful, he'd end up in Bellevue. He raised his hand suddenly and looked at it. All the color drained from his face, leaving it ashen. His thumb and forefinger were okay, but the other digits coiled. Like writhing snakes, they twisted backward across the top of his hand coiling, twisting. His hand in the dim light resembled a squirmy echinoderm raiding a nest of worms. His middle finger was the worst. It was twisting into a tight ball on the back of his hand, like the coiled antenna of a moth, like zoological similes were leaping unbidden into his mind. Sick with terror, he turned and went reeling out into the street. The girl in the high-powered sport roadster had been averaging 70 all across town. When North stepped from the curb, she was demonstrating to the boy beside her that she could drive with one hand while intoxicated. She screamed when she saw North's tall body rise above the windshield and go shooting off at right angles to the car. Running down a man was a new experience for her, and for a moment she lost control. The car zigzagged, plunging erratically across 7th Avenue and careening up the dark length of West Charles Street. The boy beside her tittered. Step on it, he urged. 
It's a hell of a long drive back to New Haven. Helen Kilday flushed resentfully and dug the paper plug out of North's speaking tube with a penknife. She knew what the plug signified. North was having one of his secluded spells. The plug meant that he didn't want young lady visitors to annoy him. It was a shame. The boy was painting himself into the ground. Why couldn't he treat his friends civilly when they called? It was a bright spring morning, and the village pulsed with optimistic, sprouting life. Small green vines were pushing through cracks in the pavement in front of North's apartment, and an alley cat was lazing in the sunlight on the wooden steps which led down to the janitor's quarters. Across the street, a couple of natives were strolling arm in arm, the girl carrying an easel, the boy looking damn glad that he wasn't a clerk in an office. Helen Kilday started ringing North's bell and shouting into the tube. Hello up there. This is Helen. Can I come up? Hello? Hello? There was no answer. The girl scowled and rang another bell. It was a shoddy trick, but she had to get into the apartment. A voice said petulantly through another tube, Look, Jerry, I told you I haven't got five bucks. Go away and let me finish my novel. The girl rang another bell. This time the door clicked invitingly. She pushed it open and ascended three flights of stairs to North's floor through apartment. The door of the apartment was ajar. Helen crept stealthily close to it, her feminine curiosity aroused. North was speaking to someone. She could hear his voice distinctly. It was tremulous with amazement. Y you say I was run down before the car struck me? Good heavens, man, do you realize what you're saying? I realize perfectly, said a voice which Helen failed to recognize. The accident happened incompletely. That's why you were merely shaken up a bit. But my hand... Your hand's all right now, isn't it? Stop worrying. I've told you what happened. I was feeling a little high last night, and I let myself go. One gets tired of working with pigments exclusively. I knew a little of the... The instability would flow into you when I shook your hand. But I also knew it would wear off in a few hours. You don't seem to realize that I saved your life. I'm grateful, of course, said North. If what you say is true, of course it's true. Peculiar gifts. Nothing could have happened to you completely last night. That handshake saved you, swirled you into a sort of, well, safety zone. And now it's worn off completely north. But I'm glad you phoned. I wouldn't want you to think me unsympathetic. Indignation swept Helen Kilday as she stood pressed close to the door, listening. North wasn't painting at all. At ten in the morning, he was talking midnight nonsense to someone as pickled as himself. Furiously, she pushed the door open and advanced into the apartment. North gasped when he saw her. He was standing still and straight by the fire grate in his living room studio, his tall boyish figure illumined by sunlight from a window to the right of him. His face was exceedingly pale and peaked looking. His right eye was swollen shut and a wide strip of adhesive tape concealed the contours of his jaw, subtly altering his entire expression. A twinge of solicitude tempered Helen Kilday's rage. North's jaw was his strongest feature. Unsupported by its firmness, he seemed helplessly childlike and in need of assistance. He had been smoking a cigarette, 
but when he saw her, he flicked it into the grate and shuddered convulsively. Why didn't you ring the buzzer? he exclaimed. I, I didn't expect you. You'll hear the buzzer ring in a few minutes, said North's guest. North's guest was standing by the window, a stock broad-shouldered man in the prime of his life, with graying hair and pale aristocratic features. He was staring at Helen Kilday with eyes so level and calm that they chilled her heart like ice. The buzzer hasn't rung yet, he elaborated. I'm afraid my presence here has prevented this young lady's entire arrival. A sudden glow appeared in the depths of his calm eyes. By George North, I'm glad I didn't wait for another cup of coffee. The first one scalded me, and I set it aside, and then there was the damned, twisting disappearance, like a little typhoon in the cup. It happens when I get angry or upset about anything. I concentrate on objects, and poof. North was staring at him in bewilderment. Coffee? I don't understand. Ravel sighed. That was stupid of me. My mind leaps ahead, and I forget that you're in a different zone. I've got to stop thinking out loud, elliptically. What I'm trying to say is that I'm glad I came right over here without finishing my breakfast. This young lady is physically perfect. I knew I would meet her after I painted her, but I didn't think it would happen this morning. There was a sudden buzz. There, said Ravel, and now she has completely arrived. She is not only here in this room, but she has rung the bell and ascended the stairs. Helen Kilday was feeling physically ill. The stranger was staring at her again, his cold eyes roaming over her with a candor that was somehow frightening. It wasn't a primitive candor. The stares of primitive males could be parried with contempt, but she had no weapon against Ravel's merciless scrutiny. Ravel said, You might introduce us, North. She will have to pose for me, but when she knows who I am, she won't object. Women instinctively trust men who can be fervent without displaying simian traits. The girl was aware of North's low voice reluctantly stammering. Helen, this is Henry Ravel. You've heard me speak of his work. Ravel smiled at her. I hope you won't think me presuming, he said. I'm simply trying to save one of my best pictures. You see, I've just completed a portrait of you, but unless you pose for me, it will unpaint itself. There was something utterly compulsive about his stare now. Helen felt her resistance dwindling, dissolving. He didn't frighten her, not anymore. There was something strangely soothing about him. His face had become a blur of entrancing darkness, which smelled as sweet as a rose. Ravel withdrew his gaze abruptly. He glanced at his wristwatch. I must be going, he said. I shall expect you, Miss Kilday, at two this afternoon. Ten minutes later, Helen Kilday was trying hard to remember exactly how Ravel looked. She closed her eyes, striving to visualize his face and figure. She shivered a little, a tingling pleasure going through her when she conjured up the shadowy outlines of his nose and forehead. His beard had also attracted her, but she couldn't remember whether it was black or gray. North was standing apprehensively above her, staring down at her shining auburn hair. Ravel's request had given him an ugly shock. He tried to shut out the disturbing realization that had just come to him. He didn't want her to pose for Ravel 
because he loved her. He was jealous of Ravel and furious at himself. She was the exacting domestic type, and it was monstrous that he should want to marry her. He would lose his independence straight off. In fact, marrying her would be almost as bad as not marrying her. It was damnably unfortunate that he had to choose between sacrificing his independence and letting his life become a dreadful, empty waste. He said suddenly, I can't have you going to a studio alone. I don't, I don't trust him. She raised resentful eyes and stared at him. I'm sorry you're so narrow-minded, she said. You'd trust your life to a great surgeon, wouldn't you? But artists are different, Helen. They're not like surgeons. All artists are a little mad, and Ravel's paintings are, well, pagan. So are yours, she retorted. I'm going to pose for him, and you can't stop me. It was past midnight when North arrived home that night. He was aware of stairs slipping out from under him, of a climb that seemed interminable through darkness. He cursed the janitor for not leaving a light in the lower hallway. He was paying a fantastic rental merely for the privilege of living in the village, and was certainly entitled to illumination when he needed it. Not the kind that he had inside of him, but the kind that came from electric bulbs high up in the wall somewhere. The walls were conspiring against him. As he ascended the stairs, they seemed to sweep down and envelop him. He was smothering on the stairs. He was inside a whale. He was Jonah. He was a German U-boat commander, taking one on the chin from the British Navy. He was Dr. Beebe. Deep under the sea, he was looking at fantastic fishes, squirming through darkness. The darkness diminished as he ascended toward the upper hallway. There seemed to be a light in his apartment, which crept out over the stairs. The door was ajar, and beyond the door he could hear the sound of muffled sobbing. Someone was sobbing inside his apartment. He stumbled toward the door, groggily, gropingly. He pushed the door open, wide open, with his palm. He didn't grip the knob of the door, just flattened his palm and pushed. The door was a straw man standing in his way, down with it. Push it aside, get to the sobbing quickly. Into the room he lurched, his legs quaking like oscillations on a seismograph. His sense of alarm, growing by leaps and bounds, was becoming overpowering. Someone had turned on all the lights in his apartment. He could feel his vision swimming, swimming at a great distance from his face, floundering helplessly in a sea of light. A chair and two tables swam unsteadily into view. Then the mantle and the grate, and a sofa with a slim form on it. The form was stirring a little. It had long white arms. The longest arms he had ever seen curled around the top of the sofa. He stared incredulously, his lips going dry. A body like that couldn't be human. It was far too long to be human, far too attenuated. It was at least seven feet long, but it was moving, stirring. Sobs came from it, long and pale and slim. The legs coiled downward over the bottom of the sofa out upon the floor. There was no logic in the way it was dressed. There was simply a little shriveled tunic covering the center of its body. Wait, wait, it wasn't a tunic. It was a tailor-made suit. There was a skirt and a coat, but they were... God, how horrible. It looked like a doll suit would on an adult except that it was wide enough for the body. 
It was wide enough, but not nearly long enough. And it was that discrepancy which made the entire garment look shriveled. The long, thin figure on the sofa seemed to be wearing a suit which it had outgrown. North felt the hair prickle along the periphery of his scalp. He became dead sober in an instant. The face of the figure had been buried in a pillow, but suddenly it turned over and rose slowly, its long arms going out in piteous appeal. Is that you, Jim? I can't see you clearly. There's something wrong with my eyes. North's spine congealed. The face that stared up at him was a long, hideous caricature of Helen Kilday's face. It seemed to be in a state of flux. The mouth was curling up like a burning cedar chip. The forehead tapered to a thin, wavering cone. The eyes were mere vertical slits set close together above a nose that was melting and dripping like tallow in bright sunlight. The voice was Helen's voice, and the hair which sprouted from the conical shell was Helen's hair, a rich, lustrous auburn, but the rest of Helen was a ghastly parody of the girl he loved. Quivering arms like tentacles flowed about his neck and embraced his shoulders. Help me up, Jim. I can't rise. Helen Kilday's throat was a flowing sea of whiteness, an unstable expanse of melting flesh. I was all right when I left the studio, she moaned. He... he put me out. He said the tension was becoming unbearable. He said he didn't want to harm me. Anguish engulfed North so that he could not speak. He looked down at her and all his nerves shrieked in anguish. He took hold of her wrists and gently untangled her long, cold arms. A fury such as he had never known before was inside of him now. Varanal, a pistol. Varanal to quiet her while he went over and had a grim talk with Ravel. With a pistol centered on him, Ravel would have to do something. He would have to do something. It would be either that or I'll blow your brains out, Ravel. I'll drill you through. Save her, Ravel. Restore her, or I'll blow your diseased, twisted brain right out of your skull. He was mumbling to himself as he reeled through the night again. She had been able to swallow, thank God. She was sleeping now, the hypnotic having smothered the waking terror in her brain. Stretched out in repose, her long body quiescent, the instability arrested a little by the drug. North's fingers tightened on the pistol in his pocket. It was a pocket Mauser, small but powerful enough to knock a man down when fired at close range. His eyes roamed about the street as he walked toward 7th Avenue. The natives were beginning to emerge from swing cellars and sidewalk cafes, and the night was filled with voices, gay, reckless voices, trading small hour farewells. The wail of the fire siren cut through the slurred goodnights with the shrill impertinence of a banshee on a tear. Down the street poured a wash of red light, blinding the stunned villagers 
and causing them to forswear all zigzagging for the night. They stood frozen in front of dark doorways, their hilarity ebbing as a bell clanging hook and ladder tore down the street, followed by three subsidiary units of motorized firefighting might. The chief's car brought up the rear, a red comet with a blazing tail of light. North gasped and swung about. Animated by inexplicable forebodings, he moved out into the street and stared up the long block, his gaze traveling across the luminous blur of 7th Avenue to the nebulosity which was Charles Street. All he could see of Charles Street was a blackness shot with flames. The flames seemed to be pouring out of some building near the middle of the block. A compulsive shuddering seized North. Somehow he knew. He knew already. He began to run. It took him five minutes to reach the middle of Charles Street, and by then there was no chance of his getting through to Ravel. The police were ahead of him. They had established a cordon and were pushing pedestrians outward in a widening circle. Go on, keep moving. Over on the other side. You want to get killed? But I live in there, officer. I can't help that, buddy. You gotta keep moving. North scurried diagonally across the street and wedged himself in a narrow, dark alleyway directly opposite the burning building. He stared up, his heart hammering against his ribs. The ancient red brick house was a blazing inferno. Grimmed face firemen were directing hose streams against windows, which were belching smoke and flame. The fan lighted doorway was enveloped in a writhing incandescence and the roof was obscured by a billowing sea of smoke which swirled down into the street and choked North's breath, causing him to gasp and sputter. The roaring, swollen flames heated the entire street. North could feel the awful heat right down to his soles. He stood rigid despite spasms of coughing, staring up at the roof. Something seemed to be moving up there. Something dark and straight, moving through the flames. The smoke shifted suddenly, receding in wind-blown spirals from a blackened chimney pot and a portion of the roof. Instantly, the crowd below let out a roar. The police cordon quivered. A woman screamed hysterically. There's a man up there. He's going to jump. Oh God, he's going to jump. Ravel was standing on the edge of the roof, staring down into the street. His stocky body was enveloped in flames, and his face was twisted into a tight, mournful mask. His expression in the red glare seemed somehow satanic, as though he had dwelt for millennia in hell and endured eternal fires without complaint. Unmistakably, he was preparing to leap. His posture was that of a man about to hurl himself recklessly into space. North went cold all over. He mustn't let Ravel leap. He'd have to stop Ravel from killing himself. If Ravel killed himself, Hill and Kilday would be better off dead. With a despairing cry, North ran out into the street. Wait, Ravel! He shouted. They're getting a net! Don't jump, Ravel! It was a futile warning. Ravel did not wait. He swung his arms back and leaped swiftly from the roof. The crowd below screamed as his ascending body struck the roof of the adjoining building, a glancing blow and started falling skyward. He receded feet foremost, his coat billowing out over his head. There was no doubt in North's mind that Ravel was really falling. 
and the crowd became suddenly so utterly still that he was quite sure they had sensed it too. Ravel was falling into the sky. Superficially, he appeared to be ascending, but subjectively, his flight conveyed an exactly opposite impression. Looking up, North ceased to be aware of up and down. He saw merely the far glimmering stars and Ravel dwindling to a faint speck in the night sky and vanishing altogether. North pressed moist palms to his temples and staggered backward toward the crowd. A policeman grabbed his elbow and spun him around. Next time you step out of line, buddy, I'll run you in. That building's gonna collapse any minute now. North's face was livid, and he was twitching uncontrollably when he returned across 7th Avenue and went reeling eastward. He wasn't intoxicated any longer. Tension and horror had neutralized all the alcohol inside him. The dizziness he now felt was due to strain alone. The weapon in his pocket was his one remaining solace. All hope had been stripped from him. He would kill both Helen and himself. He couldn't live without her and she would welcome death. So subjective was his torment that he was not aware of walking purposely at all. He turned in at his apartment without realizing that he had left the street. His steps were automatic, his body as rigid as a sleepwalker's. He started fumbling for his keys, his mind seething with despair. A suicide pact. It was the only solution, and Helen would welcome. He awoke suddenly to the realization that he was not alone. Someone was clinging to him and sobbing. He was standing in the dark vestibule of his apartment with a woman in his arms. For an appalling instant, he weighed the possibility that he had gone completely mad. It didn't fit together. No woman would come into the arms of a reeling stranger like that, would gravitate to him in darkness and kiss him with warm, eager lips for no reason at all. She was just Helen's height, and her waist was as slim as Helen's, and her kisses. He trembled with sudden joy. Everything about her was familiar, even the way her voice lilted when emotion overcame her. Jim, I'm alright now. I can see you again. But why did you leave me? When I woke up and found you gone, I was frightened. I thought perhaps you'd gone for a doctor. I came downstairs hoping I'd be able to catch you and call you back. I... I found a note stuffed in your mailbox. I thought at first you had left it there for me, but it's from, but it's from him, Jim. I had to strike a match to read the address. She was pressing a folded slip of paper against his palm. Y you better read it, Jim. It may be important. North read the note by the light of a pocket flash. He held her hand tightly because even a note from Ravel was dangerous. It might pack occult dynamite. It might shatter their lives, even now. He needed to feel that he was protecting her with all of himself, his body, mind, and soul. He read the note aloud in a strained whisper. Dear North, when you read this letter, I shall be gone. I detest explanations and apologies, but you have called me your friend, and I should like to remain your friend. 
north. It is the one human taint which I shall carry away with me. The desire to be remembered by someone on earth. You see, I don't come from your human world at all. From your point of view, I'm a man from nowhere. The body I wore, I constructed by a slow, painful process of trial and error. You've no idea how long it took me to get the brain right. It would be impossible to describe my real nature in human language. But if you wish, you may think of me as a sort of heat. A heat that can melt and dissolve everything in your world. I held myself in. I fought against the temptation to do it on a damaging scale. While I dwelt with you, I could melt events, distort and transpose them. I could even make events unhappen. But I sublimated the compulsion, worked it off on a canvas. I painted melted events. And of course, they all looked wrong to you. But you liked them, didn't you? You got a kick out of them. Everyone did. Everyone admired them. That's what I like about the village, North. They aren't hidebound by silly conventions down here. I could even paint the emerald sunsets and the brittle stars of home. A man can really paint when he knows he is going to have a sympathetic audience. I must finish. All afternoon, the tension has been increasing. I can't remain in your world, North. I might melt it, wreck everything, even the great nebula in Andromeda. I sent her back to you when I felt the tension growing. I didn't want to melt her permanently. For a few hours, she may remain slightly plastic. She was fitting so close to me that I'm afraid I warped her a little. But the strong human pattern will wave her back. Your hand's all right now, isn't it? I hope you'll marry her, North. She'll make you a good wife. And North, if you have children, and one of them is a boy, name him Henry Ravel North. It will be wonderful to know that somewhere on earth, perhaps in the village I shall never forget, is a young lad bearing my name, the son of a far off human friend. May he inherit your talents and dream youth's long dream in an attic studio close to the stars. Affectionately, Henry Ravel.